invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we are continuing this by faith series, the by faith series. All throughout Hebrews chapter 11, we see the words by faith all throughout this chapter. What a powerful, powerful chapter. Today we're looking at Abraham and Sarah, and I've invited my friend Michael Lewis to bring God's word today. And so turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and then uh, try at the same time to put your hands together and warmly welcome my friend. Michael Lewis. Thank you, bro. All righty. Are we on here? I think we just blew something, didn't we? Are we good? All right. Good. Hey, my name is Michael Lewis, and uh, I live in Palm City, and I am blessed to be here with you, Discovery. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Tim. Uh, man, he's a great man of the Lord, and uh, you are so blessed uh, to have him here. And uh, I've enjoyed getting to know him over the past four or five months. Uh, my wife and I are originally from Georgia, so I'll try to slow down so you can keep up as I speak. And I uh, want to make sure this morning you feel comfortable. But yet, listen, we are so thankful for Discovery. The first time we came, uh, Tim had been telling us about the church and I show up, and it's 11 o'clock, and we missed the entire service. They had a 10 o'clock service, and we're like, dude, you didn't tell me it was a 10 o'clock service, and I should have known better and go on the website and actually look at the website, but uh, I assumed. And so the next time we came back, we actually got to meet a bunch of people, and uh, the experience of service, and I'll tell you what, man, this is the most loving congregation I have ever seen. I mean, this pastor has done an incredible job loving on you, and it's just evident by the way you greet one another and how you greet us as well, visitors for the first time. So thank you so much for your, you know, your commitment, not only to discovery, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so we're thankful for that because this is really all about Jesus, right? All right, well, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 today, and we're going to be talking about the foundations of faith. And really, it's a simple message this morning. We're going to lay out three foundations, and we're going to talk about how that looks practically lived out in your life, all right? And so let's get started. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at and begin in verses 8 through 12. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Father, we need a word from you. We thank you, God, just for all that you've given to us all that you've provided. Thank you for the country that we live in. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come here and worship this morning. Thank you, God, for the joy that is to be found in your word. I pray, Lord, this morning that, God, as we sit here under your word, under the authority of your word, God, that your word would penetrate our hearts and cut us to the quick and just, God, it would go forth in power and change our lives, God, so that you might receive the glory that you deserve. God, you are worthy, worthy of all of our praise and all of our honor. And it's in these things in your name that we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Abraham is a man of faith. Many of you have read throughout your time of being a Christian the scriptures and you've heard of Father Abraham, and you've probably sang the song, Father Abraham. I've been to Africa and heard them sing it in their, uh, you know, Swahili language, Baba Abraham, you know, and it's just a, a wonderful thing to see other people all across the world celebrating the faith of a man named Abraham. And the reality is, as Abraham said, listen, you know, it's not about me, but it's about the one who I serve. And so as we're looking at the text of Scripture this morning, you know, Abraham serves as an example of faith here, but it's really about who his faith's pointing to that the writer of Scripture is trying to get us to focus on. So here in verse 8, it was, we begin to learn about Abraham, what we see is this here. It says, by faith, verse 8, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Listen, that word obeyed in the Greek is talking about someone who recognizes the knock of one who's knocking. 
Abraham, in fellowship with God, understood it was the God of the universe that was calling him to go forth from the land of Ur, from, of Chaldeans. It was the God who was the God of Noah, the God who saved Noah and his family from the judgment of the world in the ark. It was the God who created all things and everything who was calling him to listen and to go. Genesis chapter 12, it kind of gives you the story here. and You can read along on the screen with me. It tells you more about this call that Abraham received. And it says, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I don't know if you ever heard of the mnemonic uh, faith, but sometimes I've heard it said this way, that faith is basically forsaking all I trust him. And Abraham basically understanding that my comfort and my family, and everything's in order, but yet, Lord, it's you who's calling, and I am forsaking all. I am trusting you. And God didn't call him to wait, to go. God didn't give him a GPS on his phone to go to the land of Ur. He didn't give him an atlas. He didn't have a U-Haul trailer. He simply was told to pick up his tent and go. You know, when we think about faith, we think about the big things that God's calling us to in regards to our faith. Faith regarding a decision that must be made regarding our finances, or faith regarding the diagnosis we got receiving, you know, from a doctor about us having cancer, or faith regarding that and the direction of who we should choose to marry. Some of us have got to worry about dating before we worry about marriage. But, you know, regardless, it's one of those things that, you know, we are always looking at faith in regards to the big things. But for us this morning, as we're looking at this verse, what I want you to understand is that faith alone is not what is trying to be instilled here, but it's about faith in the God who has called us. And so this morning, as we look at the foundations of faith, what I want you to understand this morning is that faith, we must live our faith that looks forward. Look at this verse again here in chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Understand this. Faith is not just simply something in which we do. It's not just aggregate. It's something in which we look forward to. It's something in which we believe in Christ and his promises, and we expect him to do what he said. And faith here, as we see, causes us to live in a life that we look forward to the promises of God being fulfilled. And so it was by faith Abraham obeyed. He understood that it was God who was calling him and that it was God who was going to bring about the result. Secondly, not only do we see that we must live with a faith that looks forward, but secondly, we see this morning that we must live with a faith that reminds us that we are to live on this earth as foreigners. Look at verse 9. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with the same promise. In essence, this word here for went, when it says by faith he went to live, it's talking about someone who is sojourning, who is passing through a land, someone who's not putting down roots, but someone who knows that there's another destination to arrive at. Listen, the author of Hebrews is not writing something strange or something new. This is something that's been repeating itself over and over and over again since the beginning pages of Scripture, since the time where God promised that he would send his son, the seed, to crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent would strike his heel. 
It's something that we see that God, in creating man and woman, creating a people for himself, to live in a place that he himself chooses for him to live, to enjoy his blessing and to live under his rule forever. That is the theme that is woven throughout scripture. That is what the Bible continuously points about. And the writer of Hebrews has picked this up and said, listen, he understands that he is not at home. He says it here later in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 14. He says he's not looking for the city that's here, but the city that's come. Because he understands that true biblical faith, not only does it look forward, but it reminds us to live as foreigners here because this is not all that there is. Amen. Praise God for that. All the disease, all the sadness, the loss of loved ones, the pain of broken relationships, it's all fading away. Believer, let me tell you something this morning. Be of good courage because your story has not been fully written. That the page is only beginning to turn. And that God is calling you to trust by faith in his promises, to look forward to what he's doing because he who has called us is faithful. And not only is he faithful to help us to remember to look forward at his promises, but he's faithful in recreating all that went wrong, redeeming not only us, but this world for the sake of his glory. Does that excite you, believer? It excites me because every single day, my soul longs for something greater. Every single day, apart from Jesus, is a depressing day because I long in my soul to be with him. You know, that's something that we don't talk about in the church very much is depression and things like that. But that's, that's what that stuff's pointing us to. It's okay to struggle in your life with thoughts of not having what you want or thoughts of not being where you think you should be because it's all meant to point us to one who is a greater pleasure and a greater joy than anything in this world was ever meant to be. Amen. And so this morning, biblical faith leads us to look forward. Biblical faith not only looks us, leads us to look forward but it causes us to look, to live as foreigners. That's why he says in Hebrews 13 again, we're not seeking the city that is here because we have no lasting city, but we're seeking the city that is to come. So Abraham lives his life forward. He lives it as a foreigner. Thirdly, we're going to see this here in verse 11. We're to live our lives with faith, that is focused. Look at verse 11. Now it's turning to Sarah. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she was considered, since she, excuse me, considered him faithful who had promised. Sarah was no doubt a stranger to the faithfulness of God. Walking hand in hand with her husband, she had continuously seen God's faithfulness over and over. If you don't recall, uh, Sarah and Abraham were, went down to Egypt uh, on a place to where they were going to look for food, and yet God protected them and kept them safe. Time and time again, she has been able to recount over and over the faithfulness of God, and here the text says that Sarah received power to conceive by faith. It wasn't Sarah's ability to believe, but it was Sarah's ability to believe and recall in the one who is faithful himself. 90 years old, her faith wasn't perfect. In fact, she laughed, if you recall in the story. She laughed as she was told that she would one day indeed bear a son. 
And she ended up naming her son Isaac, which means laughter. For the Lord caused her to laugh. Long past the time of rearing children or even bearing children, God enabled her because of her faith in the one who had promised. Listen, I, as I begin to consider what is it the Lord's trying to get at here this morning, what is it that he's wanting to me to see? And the reality is this. 2 Timothy 2.13 says this. If we are faithless, for he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. It's not about you or your performance. It's not about necessarily your faith or lack of faith, because God is doing a work of perfecting your faith each and every day through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you are being renewed as you look into Scripture, as you come before him in prayer, that he is renewing you and redeeming you and doing a work in you through his son, Jesus. And so God is faithful. Look at Genesis chapter 15. It just shows us how faithful God is. Here in the first few verses, God reminds Abram that he is going to indeed surely give him a son. And Abraham's like, how will I know that you're going to do this? And, and listen, Abraham, you know, I brought you out of this land, God says. So do this. And if you know anything about covenant in the Old Testament, you may have heard that term. But when people make covenant together, basically they're doing more than making a promise. In essence, what they're doing is they're taking an animal like a, a bull or a ram or a goat, and they're cutting these things in half. Pretty nasty, pretty, I'm thankful we don't do these things today. But in essence, what they're doing is they're splitting these things in half, and they're walking between the parts. And what they're saying is this. If either one of us breaks this covenant, may what, be done, what was done to this, this heifer be done to us. And so it's a serious oath. It's a serious commitment. And the reality is, is that God himself is a covenant-keeping God. And the whole point here of Sarah being commended in her faith is because she had her faith focused on the one who was faithful. Genesis chapter 15, it says this in verse 9. Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these things, and they cut them in half, and laid each half over and against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot. And a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. In essence, it's not Abraham making covenant with God, but it's God making covenant with Abraham. It's that song, It's Who I Am. He's a good, good father, and we are loved by him. And it's his love that keeps us going and growing in our faith each and every day. So, believer, you can take that to the bank, that it is God who keeps you, that it is God who protects you, that it is God who is moving forth his plan in your life to help you along this journey of faith. So not only do we have a focus on God, but we look forward in the promises of God and we are to live in a foreign way because we believe that the way in which we are going is not just here, but one day to a promised home. Now listen, when we think about faith, we oftentimes, as I said earlier, think about faith in regards to the big things. But I don't think what we're learning here today, and in the context of Hebrews, that's primarily what the author of Hebrews has for us, all right? If you look in chapter thir uh, 10 of Hebrews, you're going to read 
about the full assurance of faith. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful passages in the scriptures. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll look at verse 19. We'll just read a few verses. It says, therefore, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way, opened up through us through the curtain, that is, through the flesh of Jesus. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And he goes on from here and he talks about how because of his faithfulness, because we have now the full assurance of faith, there is no longer need to continue to go on deliberately sinning. That faith actually leads to action. Faith is just not arbitrary, but it's building something within us. It's building a trust, and we see it right here in the text of Scripture regarding Abram. It says, Abraham, when he was called by God, he what? He obeyed. And the whole reality that this author, the writer of Hebrews, is trying to paint, the picture he's trying to paint for us this morning is this, is that obedience is rooted in faith. Obedience is rooted in faith. I know we all have struggles. I mean, look at your neighbor, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, listen, I'm messed up. We're all that way. We, we could all could put on the shirts that say, listen, I have issues. I don't know what you come here this morning with. I don't know what kind of baggage you brought with you. I don't know what your wheat was like. I don't know what your relationships were like. But I do know this. We live in a fallen world, and nothing surprises me anymore. And the reality is, is that if we want to hold on to God, we've got to learn to walk in obedience. Because he says, be holy as I am holy. And the reality this morning, what I want you to understand is that we can kill sin in one of two ways. Number one, we can compulsively kill it. We can, you know, bow up and, and pull up our bootstraps and we can do our best to fight sin and kill sin. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That is very much committed in the Scripture. But the reality is, is that most of us, and oftentimes each of us, are getting whooped by sin. And so not only do we want to pull up our bootstraps and give our best go to overcome sin, we want to fight off sin and do whatever we can. But the reality is, is that sometimes... We need to have a repulsive response to sin. And what I mean by that is there are things in life that you have great affections for. And the only way those affections will ever be replaced is to have a greater affection for something else. One of my favorite pastors says this. I know of no other way to overcome sin long term than to have a superior satisfaction in Jesus Christ. You want to overcome sin? Replace your temporary and worldly affections with those for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this morning, my friend, it's all about the gospel. It's not something that we move on from. It's not something that just brings us in the door, but it's something that keeps us going and growing in our faith each and every day. The fact that he came and he bore his life here, that he took on flesh, he now can identify with you and me, that he lives a life in our place, something that you could never do, earn the righteousness of God. And he took on our grief and he was struck on our behalf. The wounds that we should have received, he took and bore the penalty that we should have bore. The wrath that was poured out on him was meant for us. And the reality is, is that 
more we begin to allow this truth of the gospel to penetrate in our minds, the more our affections begin to be churned for him. The more we begin to humble ourselves and realize that we may not have it all figured out. That we may not have all the answers, but by faith, because we have focused on the one who has promised to lead us in the future, the one who has promised us a new home, a place of redemption, we can trust this morning that he is the God who is faithful, who cannot deny himself. That we, as believers, can choose to obey because we have a superior satisfaction in Jesus Christ. That that habit of looking at porn will become disgusting because we understand that Jesus died for our sisters. That Jesus gave meaning to our sisters that no longer should they ever be subject to worldly treatment or fanciful lust that we would respect them as being image bearers and co-equals because Jesus Christ gives us all meaning. So what is your struggle this morning? Are you choosing for a lesser version of Jesus? Are you settling for the things that were never meant to fill you up? Listen, you may be here this morning and you may think, well, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but, you know, I just don't really know if I believe all that. And the reality is this morning is that if that's you, what I want to say to you is that you're trusting in an authority that is completely on its own. In fact, you may not understand faith, but you have faith. Faith in your own authority. Faith in your own decision making. And the reality is, is you're not called to understand every single thing that goes on with the word of God in relation to Jesus Christ. But simply, you're called to believe. Because he who called is faithful. For he can never deny himself, even if we are faithless. So this morning, I want to invite Pastor Tim as he comes up and leads us in the time response. I want you to just consider, what is it that I am settling for? What is it my, that my lack of obedience is demonstrating to my wife or to others that I am settling for other than Jesus? How is it that my obedience could impact not only this church, but this community? You see, the fact of the matter is, is that as a people of God, it must be our longing to see the power of God flow through the mission of God. Listen, God is not done. We live in a place that is ripe for the harvest. There are six and a half million people here all the way down to Miami, and only 3% of them go to church. There are people dying apart from knowing Jesus, apart from having a hope of a better world to come. And it's not just through clever messages. It's not through popular bands or songs. But it's through faith being lived out loud, just like you did at Love Week a few weeks ago. Faith being put into practice, obedience being demonstrated day in and day out, people seeing lives that have been forever changed because of faith. Not just faith, but faith in the one who leads us to live forward. Faith in the one who leads us to live as a one who is just passing through. And faith to live as one who is just captivated by the fact that we serve a God who is completely faithful and loving. So wherever you're at this morning, I want to invite you to just respond. And what will you do this day? 
with this word from the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for Brother Tim. God, use him now as you will. Use this word for your glory. Thank you for this church. May your blessing be upon it. God, may you continue to grow this church and produce in it the fruit that you desire. Move them forward, Father, with the blessing and the power of the gospel. Build your church through these people. We thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen. And so just for a moment, what is your response to God's word? What is your response to God's word? What does your life of obedience look like or your life of disobedience even look like? I'm not asking you to answer for anyone else, but just take a moment before we step back into the chaos of this world and, and just say, Jesus, what is, what is, am I following after you and the things of you? Am I being obedient to the call that you have on my life? And so just for a moment, would you just, would you just pray that? It sounds like just such a simple prayer, but it changes everything. It changes our perspective. It changes our week. It changes everything. When we say, Lord, what is my response to, to you? How am I living, how am I living for, for you? Am I living in obedience by faith, following after you? So perhaps as, as people are praying all over, believers are praying all over, perhaps there's someone here that's never surrendered their life over to Jesus. And, and that would be the starting place, by the way, of this by faith, of living a life of faith. It starts by placing all of our faith in, in Jesus. So how do we do that? The Bible is very clear. Jesus came to this earth over 2,000 years ago. He died on a cross. He was placed in a grave, and he rose victorious from the grave. That's the gospel. And we place our faith in him. We're no longer boss of our life. Lord, you are now boss of our life. You're Lord of our life. And so right here, right now, I want you to know that it's possible for you to enter a relationship with the creator of the universe because of the finished work of Jesus. That's the gospel. And so the question is today, will you believe? Will you believe? Right now, right here. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I trust you to save me from all of my sin. I believe in you. I believe that you came, that you died, that you were placed in a grave, and that you rose from that grave for me. And starting today, I place all of my faith, all my hope in you. You take control of my life. I want to live a life of faith and obedience, and I can't do that apart from you. So starting today, I trust you.